Uh, so I was, I was very happy to see that uh, there were at least two speakers uh, yesterday who did not speak exactly about the subject they had announced because it <laughs> made me feel a lot better. Because I also got uh, a bit carried away on some aspects of the subject I announced, in particular women and their relations of patronage, and more specifically in the context of the res of resolution of debt issues. Uh, so not exactly what I announced, but the basic elements are there. Uh, so microcredit uh, and agricultural credit were, are, and probably will be for the foreseeable future, a structural element of everyday life in practically every society. Uh, it is very uh, common in rural, society, uh, rural contexts. Debt as a social phenomenon and its capacity to alter and structure social relations <coughs> and hierarchies has been noted by historians, sociologists, anthropologists, and even some of the less dogmatic economists. On the whole, although the most common and obvious line of thought sees debt, rightly of course, as the first step in, step in a downward spiral of impoverishment, much work has emphasized the reverse aspect, its function as a safety net for the economically weakest, the last resort before being ejected from the social system altogether. One of the important preconditions in order to be able to borrow uh, is, to put it very simply, to know someone you can ask. But that sort of someone, as opposed to the many someones you cannot ask, uh, has to have a number of ties with you that will make the credit and debt relation secure for him, her, uh, pretty often her actually in Egypt, uh, and viable for you. Uh, in practice, this usually involves some relation of patronage and or membership of a social network where trust could exist because of the underlying <coughs> social control, but also because of the help it can provide in cases of default. This mobilization of network can be seen at work in papyri. The most obvious, which I have described elsewhere, is that of guarantors used to secure the debt. For the lender, this system ensured that the debt was paid. <coughs> well, for the borrower, it represented a security against losing a field, house, precious objects, uh, or other securities. Because in the case of default, the guarantor would pay, and you started a new, uh, a new period uh, being the debtor of a new creditor. Who was the guarantor? Just a couple of examples uh, to show how this could be used. Uh, this uh, person, Severus, son of Bane, uh, someone who Nick, Nick Gonis has identified a whole um, <laughs> series of uh, uh, small dossier or archive or whatever. So he had borrowed 40 solidi or dinars from Antony son of Heraclitus, who was headman of Ho, uh, Dioscolis father, and a deacon. Uh, in a document, bilingual document, drawn up in Coptic and Arabic, Antony agreed to make no further claims on Severus, because Muslim bin Bashar uh, of the city of Shmoon, Hermopolis, had paid the sum for him. It's quite a big sum. Uh, the document is intended as a security for the guarantor. This is also found, uh, this kind of transaction is also found in cases of much smaller sums, more, co more commonly in cases of much smaller sums. There are indications that this could be prolonged with further guarantors so as to make the debt last forever and ever and ever. So you have a date, a, a limit by which it, you have to pay the debt. If the guarantor pays, then you get another year. And another years, it's a way of making it last. Obtaining guarantors, of course, involved the relation of patronage, and one must assume that in many cases, some uh, sort of known unknown, as Jim called them, uh, a request of some sort preceding such a transaction, asking for the guarantor, uh, although this may well have been oral in some cases. I have not yet come across a direct request by someone to guarantee, uh, to someone else to guarantee a loan in writing, or I haven't identified one. 
What one does find is letters written by patrons on behalf of prospective borrowers, asking that X uh, should lend them money, and implicitly at least, uh, guaranteeing uh, that loan. <coughs> uh, for example, this uh, document where a certain Pipus asks a holy, pious father to lend something to a certain Paul, something he calls charity for at least the second year in a row. Uh, and he undertakes to pay it back himself in kind. So before all things, I embrace the feet, etc., etc. Be so kind, the charity you did with Paul, do it again this year. Uh, whatsoever you give him, I undertake to pay it back to you in corn, in parmi, and to deliver it to you, etc. So this document is interesting uh, at various levels, and not least because it shows that the charity we usually attribute to churchmen is actually here being done by a layman, while the cleric is the lender who is going to be repaid. Uh, what makes it charity, presumably, is the absence of in interest. Well, if there is absence of interest, because the payments in kind can sometimes dissimulate interest, but that's another question. Now, another area where networks could be useful was uh, once a debt had been contracted and one of the parties in, was in some form of difficulty. Uh, there are direct petitions to the authorities by creditors for help with the recovery of debts, but more numerous still are the requests for help at a much lower level. And I have chosen here four that come from four different women in Upper Egypt. They sent letters with requests for help to members of the church, asking for help with, uh, more specifically, issues related to debts. Uh, <clears throat> even though these are not real petitions, because they're not addressed to the authorities and have no form, well, and are not formally petitions, uh, they share a number of characteristics with uh, the, such documents. Uh, looking uh, looking at documents that request favours or uh, help, it is clear that there's a certain continuum from the more formal to the less formal to the informal, and texts are not always easy to classify. At one end, we all have text showing that there was a perceived irregularity, making it conceivable for the petitioner to use the law, as they often say, in support of a claim. Uh, at the other end are letters that ask very straightforwardly for what they describe as a favour. The figure of authority is asked to intervene because of exceptional circumstances that have disrupted the author's life and capacity to pay off the debt. Something that isn't absent, of course, from formal petitions either. In many cases, categories merge in terms of content and only form can distinguish them. Uh, Jean-Luc Fournet, uh, has worked extensively on the form of official petitions in the sense of documents drawn up by a lawyer or a specialist uh, from what well, coming out of his work on Dioscorus initially. So drawn up by a lawyer on behalf of third parties and addressed to the secular authority of the area. Fournet has shown how the preludes develop quite extensively from the sixth century onwards and were structurally followed by an exposition of the facts and the request, and then the request proper. He has also done some pioneering work on the formal distinction in that period between petitions and other documentary genres, uh, a distinction that was sufficiently perceived that they were written in different ways on the papyrus and on pieces that were cut differently. So this is just one example. Uh, and I think this is something we need to insist on because very often we do these classifications ourselves according to our categories, but there are things that you know, we don't know whether in that period people did make the distinction themselves, but here it's very clear that there is a perception uh, at the time as well. Petitions would be written parallel to the fibers. So this is a petition from a widow uh, about uh, some uh, liturgies that are imposed on her that she doesn't want to take on, etc. So uh, it's it's not one of the ones I want to talk about. Uh, I'm just showing it for the uh, for the form. So petitions would be written parallel to the fibers with long lines, careful writing, 
uh, and in this they follow the external uh, material signs of literary text and to some extent of letters rather than of documents. Now we'll come back to this uh, very soon. Now I'll, go, I'll move to my four ladies uh, who are all uh, post-conquest and come from a cultural milieu that is quite different from that studied by Fournay. Uh, namely the 7th, 8th century Theban region. Now, these documents have in common that they are all addressed by women to clerics or monks. Actually, they're not all post-conquest. One is just before, and that is the first one. Uh, the first one is a letter dating from around 630 and from the archive of Bishop Vicentios uh, of Coptos, sent to him by a widow. So this is the uh, picture pub uh, published in the first edition of that papyrus. There, is, there are better pictures uh, today uh, that are out there on the internet. Papers. So. And here is the text. So you have uh, a text that is quite uh, flowery. First I embrace the sweetness of the holy feet of your truly God-loving fatherliness which intercedes for us before God. You are the one who beseeches God for blah, 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 blah. And then it comes to, I am this wretched one, miserable beyond all men on earth and greatly weighted down by grief and sadness, etc. Uh, then you come to the point where the room is I'm going to make them move anyway. Uh, to this point here. Now I beg uh, to what she actually wants, I beg your holy fatherliness to send and bring the headman of Jeme and Amos and ask them to leave me in my house and not to have me wander abroad. Uh, they said to me, you are liable for the field. The son whom I had was heartbroken and took flight. The pair of cattle which were left from the Persians, the money lender came and took them. Uh, and sold them on account of his loan, so be so kind uh, as to help me remain settled in my house. Now, the author remains nameless. She's a widow who, as we see, has had her cattle stolen by the Persians, except a few which were later taken by the moneylender because of an unpaid debt. Her son has fled the invasion after being beaten by the Persians. Uh, we're in the middle of the Persian invasion. Well, we're just after the Persian invasion. She's writing about events that happened during. She writes to the bishop, Archieros, she calls him, um, <coughs> asking him to intervene with the headman of Jenny so she can keep her house, which is most probably mortgaged because of another loan or the same loan. The addressee is most probably Pisentius of Coptos, a uh, bishop from 599 to 632 who came from the Theban region, had close links with the monasteries of the area, uh, had fled to the mountains of Jeme during the Persian occupation and waited until it ended to come back to his sea. Uh, his correspondence is preserved, part of his correspondence is preserved, is uh, uh, about to be published in Leiden. Uh, it was apparently found at his place of refuge and it shows that he enjoyed quite some prestige in the area as the biography written after his death as well uh, shows. Uh, nothing makes this identity absolutely certain, but the request is not a simple request, and presumably only a prestigious individual like Vicentius could pull off such an intervention successfully. The widow is indeed not quite of the destitute sort. Clearly, this was a family with sizable cattle, possessing a house and a field. She is in this situation due to unforeseen circumstances, the death of her husband and the Persian invasion. She uses the pathos of her disenfranchisement, a reasonably established woman having suddenly and through no fault of her own found herself in dire circumstances, to solicit a favour which is clearly expressed as such. Nowhere does she hint that it is her right to obtain this, nor does she blame anyone in particular. The length of the introductory statement is reminiscent of the proemia uh, of official petitions, which had become more and more rhetorical and flattering during the preceding century. The rest of the text follows the model of a petition as well, albeit in a very summary way. 
the address and preamble are followed by an narratio or exposition of the facts, and then by the request itself. Now, the second text will show that this first, uh, well, will show to what extent this first one is exceptional. Uh, it is sent by a woman, uh, another widow, called Pello, uh, of same area, uh, to the monk Epiphanios in a monastery, uh, in another monastery of the Theban area. So uh, it starts with uh, similar uh, expressions, shorter. And uh, I, this servant and widow, fellow uh, of the deceased Peter, etc., etc., inform your paternity, for it is you whom God has appointed to inquire concerning the affairs of the poor. Interesting statement. Uh, for before the Persians came south, my deceased husband gave some grain to the priest of Arashenetom, and they sowed it in the plain, <coughs> and not paid me anything for it until now. And look, I have paid them many a visit, saying, write a note for it until the place is at peace. So, uh, they went to law one with another. It was decided that each one should write down his share, and then it breaks off. Now here, um, widow who lives in a small village, uh, and presents herself as poor, is asking the head of the local monastery to ensure that a local shrine pays her back for the grain her late husband had lent them. This is obviously an operation of much smaller scale. Smaller sums involved, the widow's social standing is clearly lower uh, than that of the previous lady. Ironically, however, she is the lender, not the borrower, and not about to lose her house. Her letter also follows much more loosely the conventions of a petition, a bit of flattery to start with, uh, facts, presumably the actual res uh, request followed, uh, but it is lost, although its content is pretty easy to guess. The request goes to a monk with some local authority because, presumably again, he would certainly have, uh, he, would, he would have more uh, way dealing with shrine personnel and fewer qualms about it than a lady from a village. Another letter from a woman to a monk raises yet a different problem. Uh, one that is not entirely clear because the document is damaged, has a nice little hole in the middle as you see. <coughs> so she says, she writes to Zacharias and uh, she says at the time when Joachim came to settle, he received a pair of coverlets and half trimesion from Georgios. He deposited the something as a pledge <coughs> with him. For two years, he caught pigeons there. At the first year, he caught 60. At the second year, he caught 70 or 70 pairs. Uh, he filled something. I don't know how many he took. The third year, which is the current one, he came to and took another 10 pairs. Be so kind of as to ask him something and divide it with me, etc. So we have, we have, as usual, holes in important places. But what I understand, I mean, I'm happy to hear other ideas, is that Georgios lent half a trimesion and some <coughs> textiles to Joachim who deposited a pledge for them, no doubt something linked to <laughs> pigeons. Probably the right to take pigeons from Joachim's Peristerionas pigeon farm. Uh, now the woman, Tawau, seems to think uh, this person is abusing his right of access and taking many more pigeons than he should. And is asking Zacharias to do something so that they can come to a settlement. The precise circumstances are less important here in some way, in a way, uh, well, for my, uh, for what interests me, than the approach taken. This document is organized much more like a letter rather, uh, than the other two. In particular, it has a typical epistolary address, uh, then describes the facts without preliminary statements about the qualities of the recipient, and moves on to a request introduced by Be So Kind, which is typical of uh, a request formula in letters. It is unclear why Joachim does not take this action himself, uh, since he seem, seems to be still alive. She doesn't say she's a widow, and she doesn't speak of him in the past. Also unclear is why write to a father, and whether this father uh, would have more leverage that with Georgios because of his ecclesiastical status, or simply because of some other connection. 
And finally, uh, this very short, uh, incomplete letter shows a very different, almost telegraphic style. The content is again unclear, especially the identity of uh, Paulos, uh, the Paulos mentioned. But even though uh, Ezekiel is Sarah's protector, her tone is firm, the, the woman who's writing, her tone is firm and no nonsense. Again, a churchman is asked by a woman to intervene about a debt, and the affair seems to involve other priests. So this humblest Sarah writes to her Lord Father Ezekiel, I inform you that Pavlos died. Although you were protecting him and my children, he still died. Uh, look, your charity has poured upon them until now. I inform you concerning this man that he seized me for a debt, and he said, when did you pay? Uh, be so kind, and something about priests probably again asking him to intervene about this death seizure. Now the death of Paulos, uh, despite the protection of Ezekiel, this is a, 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 again a bit of a side question, but it's, a, it's, it's kind of interesting because if we interpret this protection as a stay in the shrine or the monastery uh, for the sake of some sort of healing, uh, which, which is what we see in the Toibamon documents, for example, in those documents with the children that are given then to the monastery as thanks, uh, for a healing, a form of incubation. Here could be a case of somebody who stayed in the monastery and did not heal. So, and the ones we don't usually hear about in hagiography. Uh, but okay, that's uh, that's a bit on the uh, on the side. But and again, we don't really know what it is. But we see these uh, these women uh, going right into. Uh, in very different forms to uh, churchmen about their, uh, their deaths. So in the conference for the 100 years of the discovery of the Dioscorus archive, uh, published as Les Archives de Dioscor d'Aphrodite, 100 ans après leur découverte, uh, Jim Keenan uh, published, discussed, Peak Hiro Maspero uh, 167002, uh, a long petition by Dioscorus and the wretched peasants of Aphrodito to the Duke Athanasius. Keenan's title, Tormented Voices, was directly borrowed from uh, Thomas Bisson's Tormented Voices, Power, Crisis, and Humanity in Rural Catalonia, 1140 to 1200, <coughs> published in 1998. Keenan wanted to test Bisson's approach on this papyrus uh, because of its length and detailed description of the peasants' difficulties. They accused the Pegarch of extorting much more money from them than, they sh uh, than he should have done through torture, seizure, destruction of houses, and even blocking the irrigation of canals in order to force them to submit. Now, after some technical and terminological notes, Keenan moves on to a historiographical problem of very broad concern, I quote, which is, basically, are these tormented voices those of the villagers, or are they actually the voice of Dioscorus, who has written the petition? Even though he only raises the question, uh, he does it in such a way that we know that his reply is Dioscorus. Uh, clearly, uh, the voice of the small landowners who are complaining is, uh, in his mind, not uh, accessible because it is mediated. Uh, and of course, he's not alone in thinking that. There is a lot of, uh, 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 there's a lot of literature on that subject. Uh, this discussion is, of course, a very complex one. Uh, since 1998, uh, Tormented Voices, or, uh, or even, in fact, since the earliest works uh, attempting from the 60s onwards to do the history of the silent minorities, uh, it has received a lot of attention among historians, mainly historians of the West. <coughs> Work done on petitions in the modern world, and in particular in the modern world, even those written by, even petitions written by the plaintiffs themselves, <coughs> shows the extent to which individual voices are always mediated, uh, even when they are your own, mediated through the filter of rhetorical and compositional models or what linguistic anthropologists call genre, oral genre. 
Like literary genre, every, everyday linguistic genre is uh, what allows individuals sharing the same cultural background to recognize a given style in speech situations or written texts. Uh, and this sets in motion certain specific expectations. For example, a framing device such as Once Upon a Time automatically carries with it a set of expectations concerning the further unfolding of the discourse indexing other texts initiated by this opening formula. Now, this cultural linguistic genre is what we can see at work in the petitions written by Diosporos or by other uh, uh, authors, or in letters asking for uh, favors and requests, well, or letters with requests. Whatever the improvements made to the form or the vocabulary, Dioscorus, after all, shares the cultural expectations of the voices he mediates. Now, this question can be transferred to the letters written by our four women. If, even though they are all addressed to ecclesiastical figures of different status or different prestige, they are also formally varied and they demonstrate different stages in the formal continuum between petition and letter. These two genres, as Fournay has shown in detail, have a common foundation, a petition being ultimately a specific formalized type of letter. The texts I discuss do not present themselves as petition, but despite the petitions, uh, uh, but despite this, the cultural expectation when making a request to a figure of authority dictates a certain charm. This presupposes, perhaps, a certain level of education, or to put it in different terms, a familiarity with precedent and with the norms of that procedure, and also a certain distance between the addressee and the sender. Hence the variety between the texts <coughs> greater insistence on the rhetorical niceties and greater generic consciousness in the first letter to a rather high uh, and prestigious fi uh, figure, uh, even to some extent in the second letter, while the other two uh, are more direct. Whether these were written by the women themselves uh, or by a man writing for them, the generic elements would not change enormously. And that is probably why we have so much difficulty telling the difference, telling whether it is a woman or a man who's writing. Considering the named sender is a woman, the tropes used, especially in a really composed text, will be the ones expected of women. Need for protection, dependence on men, victimization, helplessness. Of course, staging in the Goffman sense, if you like, uh, a tormented voice, staging a tormented voice, was also a formula for the success or at least the efficiency of the request. 